Good afternoon and welcome to the Japanese American National Museum. I am Rick Noguchi. I'm Rick Noguchi, the Chief Operating Officer, and I want to welcome you to today's program, the book launch of Full Circle, kind of a... and really a celebration of the poet Mitsui Yamada, as well as an uh, intergenerational reading. Um, I wanted to ask first if there's any uh, first time visitors to the Japanese American National Museum. Wow, very good. Well, I hope you have a chance after the reading and after you get your book signed to visit the museum and to see Common Ground, the heart of community, which is our core exhibition, which uh, follows the 130-year 130 history of Japanese Americans. Um, we also have an exhibition called At First Light, The Dawning of Asian Pacific America, which is a collaboration with visual communications and looks at the documentation of the kind of the birth of the Asian American movement. We also have an exhibit called uh, Fighting for Democracy, Who is the We and We the People? which is an older exhibit that we just recently put up again because it just seems so relevant to have this discussion about who the we and we the people is. Uh, so how many members are in the house today? Very good, I wanna thank all of the members for supporting the museum. As you know, we are a nonprofit organization and we rely on the support of our members. So I encourage everyone to also become a member uh, so you could come to these programs for free. A uh, couple of uh, housekeeping logistics. We, to, we do have uh, two gender-separated multi, multiple stall restrooms located on the second floor, and you can get there by taking the stairs up or taking the, uh, the elevators. And then also, if you please note the emergency exits, one is the one that you probably came in through at the front door. We also have an emergency exit out this side. So I do have... Uh, Oh, also I want to mention that uh, Full Circle will be sold at intermission and after the program, and Mitsui will stick around to sign books. Uh, they will be available until about 4.30, so uh, please hurry up and get your copy. Um, it's a privilege for me to uh, introduce, and it's an honor for me to introduce Mitsui Yamada, so I, I do have a formal introduction, but I also wanted to mention that you know, Mitsui was a really huge influence on me. Many people don't know that my background is in creative writing. And as an undergraduate, it was so important for me to come across her work, uh, Camp Notes and Other Poems. And it really validated some of the things that my family talked to me about. And to see it published in a book was so important to me that I carried, with it, carried it with me through graduate school um, in Arizona, at Arizona State University. And after graduate school, I stayed on to take a job at the Arizona Humanities Council, and we got a Civil Liberties Public Education Fund grant in like 1995 uh, to really explore the camps in Arizona. But one of the first things I wanted to do was have a literary gathering. And so of course, Mitsui was at the top of my list. And so that was the first time I had a chance to meet Mitsui. Uh, was back in 1996, and I have a photo of us together, uh, which I keep with me all the time because on my desk, on my computer, because it's so cool to see uh, Mitsui. Um, and then recently, the museum has been working with an architectural firm called Olsen Kundig, and the principal there is uh, Stephen Namata Heitner, and Stephen and I have been talking about ideas for the museum. And he said, you know, I want to bring my, uh, my family by to visit the museum. And so uh, when he introduced me to his mother, Mitsui Yamada, I didn't make the connection <laughs> until that point. And so I was just so floored to see Mitsui after, you know, 20 plus years. And so it's a huge honor for me to, uh, to introduce her today. So for the formal introduction, if I can get the page separate. Mitsui was born in uh, Fukuoka, Japan, and moved to Seattle, Washington with her family in 1926. And when World War II broke out, her father was arrested under suspicion of being a spy for Japan, and her family was taken to Minidoka, a concentration camp in Idaho. 
But Mitsui was able to leave Minidoka before the war was over, and she attended the University of Cincinnati. She later uh, earned her Bachelor of Arts from New York University and her Master of Arts at the University of Chicago. She has been a professor uh, at Cypress Junior College for 21 years and continues af continued afterwards to teach and consult at other universities. She co-founded Multicultural Women Writers of Orange County, an Asian uh, women's writing group, and she's been on the board of Amnesty International since the 1960s. And you might know that our president and CEO, Ann Burroughs, has also been involved with Amnesty International. In fact, Ann apologizes that she can't be here today because she is in South Africa, or she just returned from South Africa, where she serves now as the chair of the global uh, Amnesty International. So a lot of connections for Mitsui with Janum. Mitsui is the author of Camp Notes and Other Poems, published in 1976. She also wrote Desert Run, Poems and Stories, as well as Teaching Human Rights Awareness Through Poetry. She also co-authored with Nellie Wong and Merle Wu, three Asian American writers speak out on feminism, she co-edited Sowing Tea Leaves, writing by uh, multicultural women. And she is featured in Mitsui and Nelly, Asian American Poets, the PBS documentary that was just being screened as you walked in. So she's been very prolific. And at age 96, she uh, has a new book. So I'm just so pleased <laughs> to uh, welcome to the podium Mitsui Yamada. It's just wonderful to be here. I'm really overwhelmed. Um, I, and this is an occasion where my whole family, actually my whole family, extended family, my, um, from, even from my nephew Paul from Japan, from my nieces from, and nephews from Chicago, it's just been, it's, a, it, it's going to be a wonderful family reunion afterwards. And hopefully, and so, so uh, thank you very much, Rick, for that introduction. And I wanted to thank Kyoko for um, the the program and the many hours that she put into this, as well as, as Sharon, and and my friends. Oh my goodness, all these beautiful friends I have. What a lucky person I am and my friends from St. Andrews and um, Episcopal Church in Irvine is here. I understand I haven't met all of them. Carolyn was here, I just saw a little while ago. It's been great, thank you so much. And so I, um, and Ellie and Nellie and my friend Susanna sitting here in front. <laughs> and so thank you, thank you. And um, I will come back in, in a minute or two, um, so thank you. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Kyoko Nakamaru. Many or most of you here have likely known about the heart, influence, and reach of Mitsui's work for a long time. Growing up in the Midwest as a descendant of displaced survivors of the incarceration, I was told that women like Mitsue did not exist. I was told that uh, my obedience was my Japanese-ness. When I read Reflections of an Asian American Woman at the age of 17, it was truly a revelation. It was also before an established internet, and so it took me some years to call enough of Mitsu's work to begin to understand the impact that she's had on feminism and the creation and establishment of Asian American identity. Last year, when I had the honor of meeting her and hearing her read just a few poems, suddenly the words that had existed only on pages became a living, breathing entity. I couldn't help but wonder what shape my life might have taken had I always comprehended the completeness of standing on her shoulders, had I consciously worked from a place of belonging that was rooted in the fertile soil that she planted herself in and invites us all to. 
Now, a year later, I have such profound gratitude for the chance to root down in a community enhanced by her presence and her eldership. Today, we have the unique opportunity to hear women and non-binary voices from every generation. Mitsue de deeply represents the Nisei, though she was born in Japan and spent her early years there. Diane, Amy, and Mia are Sansei. Diana and Bryn are Yonsei. And Maya represents the youngest generation, the Gosei. Kyoko is Shin Nisei, a part of post-war immigration. Each one of these performers that you'll hear today expressed the profound reach Mitsu has had on them. Though this afternoon, none of us have the time that we wished we did to lay our proper respects, our marveling, our honor at having this chance to lift Mitsue up with our own work. Our reverence is the reason that we're all taking this stage. Mitsue Yamada does not cast a shadow for us to stand in, but instead generates a light so bright that there is room for each of us to shine, to dazzle, to speak our authentic truths. It is because of her bravery, her honesty, her relentless pursuits and tireless works that we are each able to do what we do in this world. Before we bring our first poet to the stage, I would like to acknowledge two dynamic, world-changing women who are in the program. The film that was playing when you came in was Mitsue and Nelly, Asian American Poets, a 1981 documentary by Ali Light, uh, and her late husband, Irving Saraf. Ali is an Emmy Award-winning feminist filmmaker and author of The Glittering Cave, a book of poems. Nellie Wong, poet, activist, and teacher, has published three books of poetry, co-authored three Asian American writers speak out on feminism with Merle Wu and Mitsue, and has been a contributor in over 200 anthologies and publications. She's also the founder of the Asian American literary and performance group Unbound Feet. We are grateful and honored that both Ali and Nellie made the journey to Little Tokyo today to be with us to celebrate Full Circle and Mitsue. And now to bring our first poet up. Our first poet is a brilliant and prolific writer whose works are rooted in the Japanese American experience. A sansei poet and teacher from Los Angeles, Amy Uematsu has five poetry collections, including the most recent Basic Vocabulary and The Yellow Door. In 1992, she received the Nicholas Rorick Poetry Award for her first book, 30 Miles from J-Town. Amy was co-editor of the widely used anthology Roots, an Asian American reader. Commemorating the 50th anniversary of UCLA Asian American Studies, she has an essay back in 1969 in Mountain Movers, Student Activism, and the Emergence of Asian American Studies. Currently, Amy teaches a writing workshop at the Far East Lounge in Tokyo, in Little Tokyo. And she had this to say about the influence of Mitsue. I first got to know Mitsue through her poetry. As far as I knew, she was the only Nisei who had published poems about her concentration camp experience. I included her in the big three of Nisei women literary writers, Mitsue, Wakako Yamauchi, and Hisae Yamamoto, who wrote about the camps and the lives of Japanese Americans. I got to know Mitsue better when she was teaching her Asian American lit class at UC Irvine and invited me to read. It's a delight and an honor to celebrate her today. Let's give a warm welcome to Amy. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Mitsuya, for inviting me. And thank you, Kyoko, for all the hard work you've done, and, and also Sharon, for getting this together. Um, another big three I'm lumping you together with, OK, Mitsuya, is uh, you were a big influence on me when I first started writing poetry. And I was looking for J Japanese Americans who had written about the camps. And so you had, as a Nisei, and also Lawson Inada and Janice Marie Kitani, who were Sansei and were kids when they were in the camp, but they started writing about it in their poetry. And I have to say, the three of you really have had a big impact on me uh, when I was starting at the beginning in the 80s, I started doing writing and wanted to write about the whole J experience. So thank you. Now, um, you're a feminist, and there's a lot of feminists here, right? <laughs> yeah. OK, so I've got, I don't write many rhyming poems, but this is rhyming. 
And this is about uh, called Women's Lib, Asian American Style. And it has a little quote in here from David Bowie's China Girl that was written in 1983 where he goes, oh, 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 little China girl. <laughs> Women's Lib, Asian American Style. I used to be called Oriental. Equal parts, Susie Wong, Japanese Pearl, China Doll, and Geisha Girl. I admit, I'd been raised to nod and smile, but no way in hell was I ever going to grovel as your beaming ornamental. Never again, your servile, oh so exotic, erotic yellow jewel. Never again. <laughs> Okay, I'm debating between current political poem or one about the Jay experience, but, but I'm sorry, I have to do this. <laughs> this is one of my most recent pieces, and it's uh, written in Tonka form. Tonka ha is sort of like haiku, which is a 575 syllable, but Tonka is 57577. And um, this was written this summer. It's called American Summer. The hottest ever in country after country. Ice caps keep melting, rainforests on fire, rising sea of denial. I may need to flee these hostile streets of LA, escape the road rage, sidestep the homeless, heed the slouching beast set free. The once lovely tweets of robins and nightingales are no longer heard. Just nonstop babble, unique to humans with phones. Slaughter and plunder, slavery and prison camps. Ask any native or dark-skinned victims the price of not being white. When he says, go back, does he mean where I was born? California, three generations, the only homeland I know. Dodgers on TV, now my favorite distraction from the breaking news. Savor a few hours, return to waking nightmare. This wannabe king, tweeting all hours of the night, fires up his base with falsehoods and fear, laughs all the way to the bank. Prisons for profit, brown babies torn from mothers, bullies with torches, oligarchs and snakes, summer 2019. Okay, so I'm going to end with a more upbeat poem. <laughs> I feel really fortunate to be a sansei from Los Angeles and to have experienced Little Tokyo. And so this poem has a lot of references. If you're from around here, you're going to, many of you can relate to these. Uh, another version of this appeared in the Rafu Shimpo, Shimpo, but this is called Thanks from an Aging L.A. Buddha Head. Thanks for all the JA farmers, flower growers, nurserymen, gardeners, and we women who kept them going without complaint. For a bone carnivals every summer weekend, Sansei dances at Roger Young and Parkview, holiday bowl noodles after dancing till 2 a.m., and nicknames like Muck, Mashi, Jimbo, and Shag. Samurai flicks at the Toho La Brea, Nikkei news from the Rafu, Kashu, and Ghidra. Thanks for Vegas trips to the Fremont and California Club. Sushi catching on big time. Ramen joints, too many to count. For skater Christy Yamaguchi's taking the gold and later dancing with the stars. For Hideo's bringing nomomania to our Dodgers and for stellar local Nisei women writers, 
Hisaya Yamamoto, Wakako Yamauchi, and 96-year-old poet Mitsuya Yamada. Thanks for Jap, no longer a common insult. Instead, to see Issei and Nisei in the Sunday crosswords. For Manzanar in my son's history book, and hearing my Gosei grandson tell me his school celebrates Fred Korematsu Day. Thanks for being old enough to remember China Mishi at Far East in Sankolo, Kenjinkai picnics at Elysian Park, to celebrate mochi pounding and taiko drumming, Toshiro Mifune and the Nisei Week Parade, reparations, and our own National Museum, and to honor Nono Boys and the 442, heroes like Aiko, Herzig, Yoshinaga. Thanks for being old enough to witness five generations of Buddha heads calling little Tokyo, LA, home. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I feel so lucky to be in this room and to be able to feel the gratitude with you. Thank you so much, Amy, for, for being here, for your words and all your work through these years. Our next poet is um, someone who I just met today, but uh, when her work was passed to me, I was looking for Yonsei poets that I hadn't heard of or that weren't from the LA area, um, and Sean Muirta recommended her. I was floored just astounded by her work. So I'm really excited that she came to be with us today. Uh, our next poet is Bryn Saito, an educator, poet, and organizer based in Fresno, California. She is the author of two books of poetry from Red Hen Press, Power Made Us Swoon and The Palace of Contemplating Departure, winner of the Benjamin Saltman Award and a finalist for the Northern California Book Award, Bryn co-directs Yonsei Memory Project, YMP, with Fresno artist, farmer, and writer Nikiko Masumoto. YMP utilizes arts-based inquiry to generate dialogue connecting with the World War II incarceration of the Japanese American community with the current struggles for justice. Bryn is a recipient of an Artist Initiative grant from Densho, a two-time recipient of the Civil Liberties Public Education Program grant for her work with YMP. And she recently provided the voiceover narration for, the si for Silent Sacrifice, an Emmy award-winning documentary about the Japanese-American incarceration. Korean-American and Japanese-American, Bryn was born and raised in Fresno and is currently an assistant professor of creative writing in the English department at Fresno State. Let's give it up for Bryn. Thank you. It's such, it's such an honor to be here today. Um, I remember reading Mitsue's um, essay in this bridge called My Back, um, Writings by Radical Women of Color in College. And um, since then, her work has just meant the world to me. She's somebody who has consistently shown me how to be who I am becoming over and over again. And so it's, it's just so it's an honor to, to be here to, to pay tribute and to celebrate your book. Congratulations. Um, we read together a couple years ago back in San Jose. Um, so I'm so happy to just, just be here to read some poems um, with Mitsuye. Um, so I'm just gonna read two things. This first thing I sort of assembled like last night. <laughs> um, so <laughs> disclaimer there. Um, but I was reading, I love Desert Run so much. And I was in the desert this summer. And um, so this is sort of, a, it's lines of poetry for a future daughter, future daughter, with lines by Mitsuye Yamada spliced in there. And it begins um, with the epigraph uh, and these are Mitsuye's words. We need not repeat our past histories. My daughters and I need not merely survive with strength and determination. We can, through collective struggle, live fuller and richer lives. So I'll kind of make this quote gesture when it's not my lines, it's Mitsuye's lines. A certain quiet tonight, a certain sanctuary, I cultivate a nostalgia for the present. Moonrise over mesquite and me in the outer dark, away from the orbits, dreaming your face. The desert never ages. 
If you must fit me into your needs, I will die and so will you. So I dream of a life beyond mine with dark matter desire. I study the creosote's tears. In New York and young, I worried about sunlight. Now I stroke a small lump in the mysterious slope between thigh and lower belly and terror sings through me like a corrugated flame. There are worlds inside this world laboring for birth. There are garden caves beneath the earth's soil where the dead dance and tree roots lock arms drinking water. In New York and young, I stood close beside my sisters. I stood in the broken theater, stage bashed and bleeding with signs of scrawled hate. I was too young to hear silence before. I am back to claim my body. In the world I imagine for you, women from the deep rise from marshland, saguaro, red rocks, hauling from the bogs our prehistory. Turtles, turtles tunnel avenues over the skies of Manhattan. The desert is the lungs of the world. As a ghost, I grow stronger and lighter at the same time, transfused by creosote shrubs. I talk stories to your daughter's daughters from the desert ruins. Thank you. Thank you for those lines. <laughs> Thank you. And um, lastly, I'm going to read a letter. I, I also kind of a new letter I wrote this summer to my father. My father, um, my father's parents, my grandparents met in Gila River when they were incarcerated during World War II. And so my dad and I did a pilgrimage together to the desert, which is why the desert has been in my mind. And I've been reading Desert Run and those poems. Um, for the first time, we went to Gila River together and we're on the land together. And um, so I wrote this letter to my dad after we had he then got, we went to Phoenix, he boarded a plane, went back to Fresno, where I'm from, and um, I wrote this for him, and I wrote it thinking about, I think just thinking about um, the stories of fathers who are taken, the stories of families who are being separated, story of Mitsuye's father, the Nisei generation, um, this is, you know, everything going on that's, that's been on my mind. Dad. There's a new way I see the garden now, the one you've been tending for decades on Garden Avenue, of all names, the street of our family home. In haiku, written by former camp prisoners, days and seasons are tracked by the falling leaves of the moss rose, petal to earth. Poets in camp, numbered months and years by the memory of their home gardens left behind on the west coast. Flowering rhododendrons and peony buds imagined as remaining firm. I think of us traveling that week, the summer of 2019, away from California, along the train's course, and through Arizona, and on to Santa Fe. How far I brought you from your garden. Did you think of the sagos, the summer tomatoes and basil, the azaleas and red maples, the night-blooming lantana, trees needing trimming, grass going brown, all of the work awaiting you? Did you imagine the dogs chirping, the silent white bucket, and mom dragging the hose across the lawn to wake the fountain? Here in the Southwest, I find myself pining for the great Central Valley as I did when I lived in New York, or that decade by the bay, exhausted from cold bridges and colder waters, longing with my entire body for the landscapes of childhood's kingdom. I understand now I am nothing. I am the daughter of a living father, blessed to be returning to you after these fire and ice travels through North American landscapes, spotted by our elders' lives, their prison desert homes, and other jails and prisons with and without bars and barbed wire. You were not taken. In the night and shirtless, you were not captured or broken by the century's light despite my nightmares. You took your time in the summer garden where Lee and I played as the light set, basiling our bodies against mosquitoes, baking mud sweets in California's sugary dusk. Dad, your voice is wise now beyond kindness. 
I'll see you soon. Thank you. Again, we are so lucky to all be in this room today. And there's so much rich history for those of us that are, you know, more recent immigrants um, from Japan and those of us that have been here for generations. These stories are all such nourishment and healing, intergenerational healing, I think, for all of us. So thank you so much for these words and for sharing with us today. Our next poet, I just got the first chance to hear a couple weeks ago at the Tuesday Night Cafe. And she is a phenom. I can't wait to see what she does um, in the coming years, too. Um, Maya Kuita Osumi just started ninth grade at Culver City High School. She plays basketball with the Venice Sparks, and we took her away from a tournament today, so we're pretty lucky. <laughs> runs cross country and is a member of Nakama Daiko. She and her friend Tula are members of the Sister Friends and have performed at Tuesday Night Cafe over a dozen times. She is honored to join Mitsue Yamada for this special poetry reading today. Thank you so much for being here, Maya. <laughs> Hello. Hi, I'm Maya. Um, I want to thank Kyoko for inviting me to come speak here and to uh, Mitsuya Yamada for inspiring so many uh, young women like me or people like me. Okay, so I have a few, few poems and the first two are about Obon that I wrote a few years ago for Tracy Kato Kiriyama for Discover Nikkei. It's a website, I, I, yeah, okay. So the first um, poem is called Dancing in All Directions. Families young and old gather around the yagra waiting for the dancing to begin. The kana starts us off. The crowd inches forward in one fluid motion. I look up. The sun is setting. Our ancestors' lanterns swaying in the wind and lighting the circle. I, I look down. The streets chalk ridden. I hear the clicking of geta and the swaying of kimono. Uh, toddlers stagger under flying hobby coats, frantic parents chasing after. I look left, following elders who lead the way. Uh, bocce in hand, we pound the drum. And I look right. Uh, grandparents lounge in beach chairs uh, with a front row view. Pa oh yeah, okay. Uh, parents on picnic blankets and grandkids on the curb shape, eating shaved ice. No matter which way I look, I know I'm home. So the next poem I have is called We Keep Dancing, and it's about the, an obon song called Tankobushi. Yeah, you know that, probably. OK. So Tankobushi is like the struggle. We dig and we dig. We search for communities in need of support. And when we're faced with mass shootings, kids locked in cages, and racist presidents, we throw it over our shoulder and keep dancing. But sometimes we get tired, so we take a step back wipe the sweat off our brow and keep dancing. And when we're faced, and, and even in the toughest of times, we push and we push. They hold us back, but we keep pushing. And when this struggle ends, uh, we dust off our hands and keep going. This song is never over, we keep dancing. Okay, so my last poem, is about my name and my experiences at school, because I'm in school, so. <laughs> um, oh, just for reference, my name is spelled M-A-I-Y-A, so, because it's about my name, so. Okay. <laughs> Five of us in social studies, four in PE, one of me. Not Maya, not Maya, just Maya. Don't let the I fool you. My name is not some riddle for you to solve, not a game of who can pronounce it right, just Maya. Uh, Maya Angelou's namesake, an honor at the least, but throw in the I to make it Japanese. <laughs> and amidst the chaos lies Grace. My, oh, my, my middle name, Grace. Simple and elegant, peaceful and calm. Uh, Grace Lee Boggs, an Asian-American activist, Strong like the roots of an oak, 
a break from the mayhem. <laughs> now don't get me started on hyphenated Japanese last names. <laughs> you can't handle the rich history, struggle embedded in each syllable, every ancestor locked behind barbed wire, too much for you to handle, just Maya. Uh, confused substitutes, constant misspellings, crippling self-esteem. Not no. <laughs> that your opinions don't matter to me. I think what you want, my identity, my culture, my name. My, just my grace, quito me. Thank you. I actually got to put that in an email when somebody spelled your name wrong. <laughs> and I was like, the I is important because that speaks to her Japanese-ness. So <laughs> thank you so much for being here today and taking the time to share your work with us. Really brilliant. Um, whoops. And you're very tall, which, you know, with an incoming ghost, I'm like, do you have a chance? <laughs> Are you going to be over 5'5"? Five five? <laughs> you can tower over people at family reunions. It will be very exciting. <laughs> Today we have the honor of bringing in um, someone who said, I'm not, but I'm not a poet. She's a brilliant writer. And, um, and she gathers all these incredible histories and, and does all this beautiful work in the community, not just with the elders, but with families and preserving story. And I felt like including her in today's program was essential um, because it is preserving those histories, retelling them, talking about them, telling them to the next generations, to people who have never heard them, that creates so much vitality within our community and visibility out in the world. And especially in times like these, where we are watching history repeat itself, I think it's more essential than ever that we amplify those voices. So thank you for being here today. Diana Emiko Tsuchida is the creator of Tesaku, an oral history project and magazine series dedicated to sharing stories and first-person perspectives on the Japanese-American incarceration. Tesaku, which translates to Iron Fence, was originally the name of an Issei and Kibe published series of essays and poetry in Thule Lake. Her work has been featured on NPR's Code Switch, NBC's Asian Pacific America, The Rafu Shimpo, and a TEDx piece, Plaza Talk. Her grandparents and father were incarcerated in Santa Anita, Topaz, and Tule Lake. Her grandfather, a vocal resistor against the camps, was sent to the Citizen Isolation Center in Leop, Arizona, and later the Department of Justice camp in Crystal City. He nearly took the family back to Japan from Tule Lake, but they ended up resettling in Berkeley, California after the war. As a feminist studies major at UC Santa Cruz, Diana was initially introduced to Mitsue's perspectives and activism through her co-authored work, Three Asian American Writers Speak Out on Feminism. Let's welcome Diana to the stage. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Kyoko. Um, as she just uh, said, I am honored um, to share poetry today uh, with you as a mere messenger, uh, just as somebody that um, was honored to be able uh, to uh, get permission to share um, a, the work of her grandfather. So um, she is not here today, but I'm basically speaking on behalf of the Alice and Iwamoto family, um, whose grandfather, Akira Togawa, was an Issei. And um, his poetry um, I wanted to share uh, today because he documented every facet of camp. And, um, and he also is a, was local. He lived in Boyle Heights um, and immigrated to California in 1923 and uh, was an artist and writer his whole life. So he wrote before camp and in camp and after, and I felt that his work and, and these words and reflections from the early 30s to um, just right after the war in 1946 was appropriate in sharing um, this breadth of history and uh, representing an Issei voice. So uh, the book that I am 
literally reading from is called Songs of a Honeybee, which was his original compilation in the 1960s. And uh, he wrote all of these in Japanese originally. So keep that in mind that um, I'm sure the nuance, some nuances get lost in here, but I'm gonna be sharing um, four pieces. The first is called An Ordinary August. I found a sparkling jewel in the garden during the early morning dew. Seems like the beauty of the spider wart has been forgotten. The sky appears to be clearing after a mountain fire. A hummingbird flies like a humming butterfly to collect honey from the flowers. My second child is sleeping in a stroller. The hazy daylight moon is in the sky. My child is pulling on my hand to ride the merry-go-round in the park. Church bells are ringing in the distance. I am enjoying the evening breeze among trees here in Boyle Heights. The second one is called Visiting Graves. And uh, I believe this would have been written in about March or April of 1941. Trees are glowing with new buds among soft floating spring clouds. Pigeons and little birds sing, surrounded by fresh grass. A Buddhist priest starts chanting with a smaller priest nearby. We visited the evergreen graveyard to pray for the dead of the China-Japan War. Somebody is talking. That smaller priest is cute. This is like a scene in the Japanese countryside with father and son priests. There are so many graves of my country people. The Japanese characters look familiar yet sad. My friend's words, it is all right. As we will all have good gravestones here, it means we live in America forever. Touches me while incense sticks burn. So, yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> it, his poetry to me, um, you know, there's this haunting premonition um, for us that he wrote it while experiencing it, but we have this vantage point of time and history and we see what's coming. And I, I think this is why his work is so powerful to me is uh, because he was, he captured every moment. This um, next poem is Distorted Sun, and I was told that it was a family favorite. Um, his granddaughter said this is a fa favorite within the family. This was written in Poston. A distorted morning sun is rising behind purple mountains. With green woods at its foot, the sky is simply blue. My five-year-old child drew this scene with colored pencils. Every morning she eats breakfast in a cold room with her little hands holding a cup of cocoa. After breakfast, she joins people at a bonfire outside, watching the rising sun from the mountains in the east. As imagined by my little child's mind, she expressed it in this simple drawing. My cute, innocent child brings tears to my eyes. We did not know where we were going. We were packed in a train and had a long, long desert journey. Holding her Shirley Temple doll, she cried, I want to go back home. I want to go to Los Angeles. Even though she lost weight, she lived through this hell of blazing heat and did not get sick. She went to school every day and began to enjoy this desert life. It made me very happy. My dear, innocent baby girl, I hope you will never have to experience this type of life again. Let us pray together that the distorted sun you drew will become a big round one, shining peace on the whole world. And uh, the, f the final one uh, that I wanted to share is uh, called Voices from the Earth. I think, oh, here it is. <laughs> uh, so this is November 1946. He, the family came back home and um, he wasn't writing for a while, but he had this year to sort of reflect. Why is the autumn sky so blue and cold? Why are the persimmons, which my friend sent me, so red? Birds are singing, perched on persimmon trees in the backyard. In my old hometown across the ocean, my mother is now alone. Father has passed away. Toshihisa was killed in the war. Mother is all right. 
Uncle Taku's house was burned down. After five years of no communication, the Red Cross gave me the news. I wanted to cry, but no tears appeared. Alas, I am a citizen of a defeated nation. In my homeland, it must be much more tragic, maybe endless. I am not the only one who has this indignation. To whom should I complain? For what should I be sorry? What should I hate? In what should I put my whole soul to live? I press my ear on this quiet earth where even the chirping of insects has stopped, listening for voices from the earth. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's really a wonderful addition to have those voices brought into this room. And I knew I would forget something. So as I was like with a glue stick this morning, apparently I missed one. So <laughs> pardon my giant computer here. Um, our next poet, um, or our next writer actually and performer uh, has, has contributed so much to voices from this community and amplifying and uplifting them. So it's really an honor to bring her here. Uh, Mia Iwatake's life experience as an Asian woman activist, Japanese American warrior for justice and reparations, host and producer of East Wind Radio Series on KPFK FM, sponsored by United Nations NGO to the UN Decade for Women Convention in Nairobi, Kenya, an author of first publication on API cultural barriers in reproductive health care, have inspired a lifelong respect for cultures, community, commitment to justice, and equity. Her poetry, writings, and columns are shaped by an appreciation for the profound effect of words and language on our culture and times. Let's give a big warm welcome to Mia. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Mitsuya, for inviting me. Um, I reread Camp Notes, and oh my God, I thought, how can I read in the presence of someone like Mitsuya? But you've had a profound impact on me. Mitsuya Yamada says, art cannot be separated from its political content. And for me, Mitsuya's life, her art, her writings, have added clarity to the camp experience, championed women's rights, spotlighted and validated Japanese American and Asian American women writers, celebrated multiculturalism, embraced internationalism. And as a writer, as an artist, she is everything I aspire to. Thank you, Mitsuye. So I finished this poem yesterday, so you have to excuse me. To, that's, I'm, someone else used that. I'm going to use that too. <laughs> Tsuru, the Japanese crane, is a symbol of hope and longevity. And in Japan, some say it can live up to a thousand years. This June, Tsuru for Solidarity and other Japanese Americans went to Fort Sills, Oklahoma to protest the detention of 1,400 children seeking asylum at the very same facility where Japanese Americans were imprisoned during World War II. Thousands, went, that, that's not the end of the story. Thousands, thousands of colorful origami tsuru were hung as a symbol of hope and resistance. And these mass protests won national recognition and national attention and forced the plans for opening Fort Sills to be withdrawn. Yes. Okay. Tsuru, a young crane lost, soaring, seeking, searching for familial sounds, the tsuru, tsuru of graceful wings fluttering through the summer skies. Her outstretched wings have seen many days, many miles, searching for family. The young crane cries, Mama, Papa, where are you? Cry, little crane, cry. Wings beating, tsuru, tsuru, a hushed brushing sound as she circles the camp. Barbed wire, silent barracks, dimly lit bulb casting shadows on a small wood table where deft fingers gently fold tsuru, tsuru for peace, tsuru for hope. Across oceans, clouds mushroom, 
then dissipate, revealing a young sadako, gentle fingers intently folding a thousand cranes, tsuru soldiers for peace, for hope, until time runs out. Tsuru, tsuru, the wings beat harder, her journey bringing reluctant witness to imprisonment, family separation, nuclear devastation. Seventy years across time, desert detention, grim guards, demean and defile, deaf to silent screams, whispered whimpers, children as chattel, innocence on ice. Threading her way through space and time, from camp to camp, woven in history, the young crane finds her family in the spirit of 10,000 tsuru, coming together, connected, crafted in unison by hundreds of gentle fingers, by families born of the camp, rising in resistance across clouds of time. Tsuru, tsuru, tell your story. Tsuru for justice. Tsuru for solidarity. How many of you were at the Commission for Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilian Hearings? I was one of the lucky few also. And those stories by our people who provided testimony at the CWRIC touched my heart and brought me such deepened respect for our Issei. He came back from camp, a changed man, this once proud farmer who left a scent of ripe tomatoes in his wake as he weighed and measured these rich red treasures packed and stacked crates for the pleasure of the market. This ordinarily remarkable man of the land who carried the soil of succulent strawberries beneath cracked fingernails all the way to Manzanar until it was washed away by his wife's tears. Precious tears from the strong woman who shared his love and his harvest, but would not share her tears in front of wartime vultures who circled his farm and stole his land in his ideal of America. And still, each night, he is visited by memories filled with a sumptuous sense of lush, luscious, fleshy tomatoes and the fertile farmland he had generously gifted with his grit and gaman, this man of the land, this Issei. Oh. <laughs> so, on a lighter note, I tried to try some tanka too, which as Amy said, is a Japanese poem consisting of five lines, the first and third are five syllables and the rest have seven, totaling 31 syllables to give a picture of an event or a mood. So this was a mood that happened to me in my garden. Red camellias prettily preen their petals swaying in the breeze, ladybugs alight on leaves as they frolic in the spring. The question. Turning toward the sun, gardenias seek direction. Fluffy, fluffy clouds above float aimlessly across skies that no longer hold answers. Sanctuary. How peaceful it is, seated amidst these flowers. Scents sweeten the air, softening sad thoughts and loss to reawaken beauty. So, on a different note, do you remember in high school at the dances where this, there was this one defining moment where a special song came up and you just had to dance with that guy you liked? <laughs> For me, that song was Ooh Baby Baby by Smokey Robinson. <laughs> so there are gonna be some lines in here and if I get enough singing lessons, someday I could sing the lines, but right now I have to speak some of the lines from the song. Ooh, baby, baby. Ooh, smoky, silky, soft, and sensuous. A vibrato tasting of honey sliding down my throat. 
Sing, Smokey. Come and get these memories of chaperone dances and dudes with slick back pompadours wearing Sir Guy shirts and freshly ironed khakis. Hot cars, the color of my tube of candy apple red lipstick, slipping and sliding through chubby folds of Nagahide tucked and rolled in the back seat of his Chevy 409, parked outside of the high school gym. Mistakes, I know I made a few, but I'm only human. You make mistakes too. Okay, all right. Tight curls, tighter skirts, and teardrop earrings, waiting for that fine, fine, super fine dude to gangster pimp over and cop a dance when they play Smokey. Sweaty slow grinds with the lights turned low, soft French kisses in the shadows of the high school gym. Sing, Smokey. I'm just about at the end of my rope, but I can't stop trying. I can't give up hope. Sing, Smokey, sing. <laughs> so, and last, an ode, O-D-E, is a celebration. And this is my ode to the Omosubi. Noble Omosubi stands tall, his majestic mantle, a swath of black nori, on a snowy backdrop on lightly salted rice. Alluring omosubi, wrapped in a robe of crisp nori, shimmering with sea green highlights, perfumed with sweet scents of the ocean. And hidden in her womb, a luscious umeboshi teases the palate with central rushes of tartness. A first bite into the fragrant glistening rice arouses the senses, summoning succulent memories of church bazaars and family picnics and Toshiro Mifuni lustily wolfing down plump morsels of rice in San Judo. <laughs> Fresh, fragrant balls of rice recall autumn harvest and the nobility of Japanese farmers. The noble omosubi, a celebration of senses, of yin and yang, Crackling and smooth, sea and land, ebony and ivory, caressed and shaped by loving hands, our noble omosubi. Itadakimasu. <laughs> yes. How many of us are going to go home and play some Smokey Robinson? <laughs> I have remembered. <laughs> thank you so much. And I also want to say thank you for being here today. Mio had a prior engagement this morning um, to speak and uh, speak out against gentrification in Little Tokyo and to do some work around fundraising so that we have the capacity to um, help purchase buildings when they go up for sale instead of allowing outsiders to come in and take from this very small community that we need to preserve. So thank you for your activism and your work on that. So without further ado, <laughs> um, let me stop talking and bring up our, our next performer, um, who is just a phenom for Asian American and black liberation. I am so honored to get to meet her. Um, I, I actually forgot all the books that I had that I wanted people to sign so I don't have to annoy you with them. You're welcome. Um, but when I, when I pulled out Diane's book, I realized, well, she already signed it. Is that weird to have her sign it again? So now, since I forgot it, I don't have to deal with that embarrassing thing that I just confessed. <laughs> Diane C. Fugino is a professor and interim chair of Asian American Studies at UC Santa Barbara, an author or editor of books on Asian American and black liberation, including Heartbeat of Struggle, The Revolutionary Life of Yuriko Chiyama, Samurai Among Panthers, Richard Aoki on Race, Resistance, and a Paradoxical Life, Wicked Theory, Naked Practice, A Fred Ho Reader, and her forthcoming book, Black Power Afterlives, The Enduring Significance of the Black Panther Party. 
She co-organized a national symposium on Asian American activism and is a core organizer of the Ethnic Studies Now Santa Barbara Coalition. She is writing a political biography of Mitsuye Imara and her brother, the Reverend Michael Yasutake. Welcome to the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Kyoko and Sharon, for organizing this amazing tribute to Mitsui Yamada and the ways that she's influenced all of us. And it's amazing to hear the multiple generations of JA women's voices coming out. Um, I've known Mitsu for over 25 years, and her writing and her activism have really shaped my lives in so many ways. And now getting to go through the archives and re-reviewing my oral history interviews that I had done with Mitsu and her brother many years ago. It's been an amazing journey. And so it's just such an honor and delight to be here to recognize Mitsu Yamada in this way and to have this book launch take place within the Japanese American community and here at the Japanese American National Museum, which if you knew my late mother, you would know what a special place this is for our family. Mitsui Yamada, the poet, teacher, activist, mother, grandma, wife, sister, daughter, and chronicler of Japanese American life is truly a remarkable person. She's a Nisei born in 1923 who wields the pen to write poetry that is at once tender and understated and haunting and revealing of contradictions just below the surface. She is a keen observer of life critically self-reflective about herself and those around her, and candid about Japanese American experience. She was at once shaped by the expected conventions for Nisei daughters and Cold War femininity, and bucked those confinements. Growing up in Seattle, she enjoyed listening to her father and his friends read out loud their senyuryu poetry. She loved talking with her father about literature and the books in his large home library. She was writing short stories in high school and poetry in the Minidoka concentration camp. She earned a master's degree at the University of Chicago in 1953. And she was also, in the 1950s and 60s, a stay-at-home mother attending church and raising four children in Chicago, New York, and the white suburbs of Sierra Madre and later Irvine. It sometimes takes a crisis to dislodge one from the routinization and domesticity of life. And Yamada was surprised by her own reactions to being diagnosed with terminal emphysema in about 1963 and thinking that she had only a year to live instead of doing what she thought she would do, which was devoting herself to her children and husband, she did what she had always wanted to do, writing, teaching, and activism. She pulled out her camp notes, meaning the poetry and the scattered thoughts she had written in Minidoka. And she also began attending poetry readings and meeting other poets. Over time, she met the feminist poet Alta of the small independent Shameless Hussy Press, <laughs> which in 1976 published Yamada's first book of poetry, Camp Notes. This was three years after the release of Jeannie Wakatsuki Houston's Farewell to Manzanar and the same year as Michi Wagelin's Years of Infamy. It was a moment when literary writings and the early redress movement were making visible the unjust incarceration of Japanese Americans. But it was still quite controversial to speak out about the concentration camps at that time. Yamada is best known for writing about themes of silence. In one of her most widely read nonfiction essays, Invisibility is an Unnatural Disaster, published in 1981 in the groundbreaking This Bridge Called My Back, edited by Sheri Moraga and Gloria Anzaldúa, Yamara laments about the ways Asian American women are not seen or heard. She writes about a student who expressed, it made me angry. Their anger made me angry because I didn't even know that Asian Americans felt oppressed. I didn't expect their anger. She was writing about the racism and sexism impacting Japanese Americans and Asian Americans, the hardships faced by Issei women, domestic violence, problems within families, and the injury of invisibility. In her poem, Warning, she cautions about the false protections that silence provides. She was her father's daughter, never spoke out, never signed a petition, but she still ended up imprisoned. 
She writes, my silences had not protected me. That she quotes black feminist Audre Lorde is revealing of the third world feminisms or multicultural feminisms swirling around her. And she helped to build through her writing and on the ground activism, this third world women's movement in the mid 70s and 1980s, including the documentary Mitsue Yam and Nelly. It is more unexpected, but Yamada also wrote movingly about the silent beauty of the desert, something she never appreciated when she was surrounded by the desert daily in Minidoka. I don't have time to say much about the decades of activism that she's engaged in, including being on the national board of the Amnesty International USA and helping to organize and participate in the Asian American Women's Conferences in Los Angeles and Washington DC in 1980. But I do want to say that she's been actively involved in, for decades in supporting prisoners of conscience internationally and women political prisoners in the United States. And on a personal note, it was Mitsu, her brother, the Reverend Michael Yasutake, and Yuri Kochiyama who inspired and made it possible for my husband and me to begin visiting political prisoners. You have before you, or those of you who've purchased it, you have before you Yamada's third book of poetry, or sixth book, including edited uh, volumes. Full Circle, New and Selected Poems came about through a really warm and generative collaboration among five feminists of color. Mitsue, her daughter, Hedy Mochert. You should stand, Hedy. I'm going to embarrass her. <laughs> Thank you. Hedy designed the stunning cover and the whole book. Um, and the other feminists of color are three UCSB, UC Santa Barbara professors, Shirley Lim, Shuri Moraga, and me. Full Circle is the first publication, I'm proud to say, published by UCSB's Department of Asian American Studies. And we have in the room seven UCSB scholars who came down for this. Um, at age 96, Mitsua continues to amaze me with her energy, her continuing engagements with political justice concerns, her stirring writing, her thoughtfulness, and the ways that she's nurtured loving family relations across seven decades. Her four children, their spouses, her grandchildren, her brother, and extended family and friends have come from near and far to be with her today. And Mitsu is a huge inspiration to me and to so many others, as we've seen by the multiple generations of Japanese Americans honoring her in this program today. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mitsue Yamada. Hello, all of you. <laughs> it's really good to see so many of you here. So much, so much talent among the young people, so much youthful energy. I just feel quite energized now. Um, in, her, in her essay uh, in my book, Full Circle, uh, Shirley Lim poses a question, does poetry matter? And I think that what was demonstrated by the young poets today, Amy and uh, Mia Iwataki, I, you know, indeed, of course, poetry does matter. It was just really wonderful. Hasn't it been wonderful to hear them all today? Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so now I have the task to try to further assure you that poetry does matter. <laughs> so I'm going to open uh, my reading with two poems that um, dream big, taking risks, you know, which is kind of an unusual poems for me. So I picked out two poems that uh, would um, uh, express some joy. And so, um, and my first, my opening poem is, I Would Dance. I would, if I could, <clears throat> 
trippingly dance through the great halls of Terracus. I would glide through the birds of paradise. I would sail over waters in a yawl or a sloop, and I would plunge into the depths of vast oceans. Sphere. I would, if my world were a brain-shaped island lined with silk chiffon, I would straddle it and fly from the open stratosphere. Gentle breezes will raise the hairs of my cheekbones as I sing in a voice I never had, a lovely tune I just made up. I will fulfill every single ineffable moment of life left in my body. <clears throat> so now, some of the few, I have been writing poems about my family and members of my family who are no longer with us. And so I've chosen a few of those. Um, my mother, who was, a kind of a taskmaster while I was growing up, mellowed during her later years. When, and when she came to live with me, every morning I noticed that she, I hear her droning, um, saying her prayers. And one day she asked me to um, ask me if I would like to sit down and pray with her. And I said, well, OK. And she said, well, it might take about an hour. And I thought, well, she, she must be exaggerating. <laughs> And so I, I, so I wrote this poem, but don't worry, it's not going to take an hour. <laughs> so the title of the poem is Grandma's Prayer, and it is in her voice. Grandma now, old lady, almost 98 years old, I have 14 grandchildren, and all of them are now married, except eight. None of them smoke, none of them drink, and none of them have robbed a bank. <laughs> but all of them have gone to college. She was so proud of them. I pray every day for their health and happiness, each child and grandchild by name, except some I don't remember. So I say, God bless my Chonung, my eldest son, his wife, and his children, and their friends. <laughs> my Jinan, second son, and his wife, and his family, and their friends. And my Chonan, my eldest daughter, and her family, and so forth, and so on. I pray for all my good friends still living and their families and their friends. Grandma prays for everybody. <laughs> my father and I had a remarkable relationship. Um, we shared our love of poetry and literature. He introduced me to Shakespeare. He respected me, and he encouraged me to go to college, which was kind of unusual in those days, you know, when you consider my age. And um, so I wrote this poem, but, you know, sometimes even those people you love dearly, uh, they disappoint in some way or another. And so I wrote this poem in a flash of anger, maybe years after he died. And the title of the poem is Father. If you, not, if you had not died when you did, and I knew then what I know now, I might have killed you. <laughs> Half a lifetime you stood between us with your laughter and your poetry. Half a lifetime 
I was held captive to your charm, not getting to know mother. Uh, my husband was a very talented person, so this poem is for him. What you left behind. You have been gone too long, but do not fret, for you have left behind your artistic eye with your sons and daughters, your scientific mind with your grandchildren, and most important of all, your ethical and sensibilities with every single one of them. I miss you most when I see couples together so comfortable in each other's presence, but I think of all that you left behind. And now for a change of pace. Um, I have been involved for a number of years, as uh, Diane pointed out, with human rights work and uh, with Amnesty International. And, I, and through the years, I noticed that many of the prisoners of conscience, as we called the prisoners, were poets, writers, editors, community activists, all of which I was at one time or another, and leaders of religious organizations or ministers, as my older, my, uh, older brother was. And so human rights work became very personal to me. And um, during this, this, the following poem is what I wrote during this period. The title of the poem is, In Some Countries. Excuse me, I'm going to take another swig. <laughs> In some countries, poets are taken seriously in high places, and writing poems may be a crime. In these countries, poems are cryptograms, encoded, must be skinned and probed. Offending poets like Mila Aguilar are arrested and tortured, undercover bloodhounds expose metaphors. In some countries, writing poet, poems is deadly business. In my country, poets are free to read in cafes, bars, and other low places. And I might add, in some high places like museums. <laughs> <laughs> Trotted out is window dressing at presidential inaugurations. But most of all, poets could be speaking in tongues. In my country, poets like Pat Parker are ignored to death. Um, and as Diane pointed out, I, we've been also been involved in working for prisoners of conscience within our own country, and my brother's organization, my brother, the Reverend Michael Yastakis organization was called Interfaith Prisoners of Conscience. And um, during one of my visits to a prisoner in um, Dublin, California, um, she was telling me about this kind of astounding story about um, how the prisons used sensory deprivation to um, keep the prisoners compliant. And so um, the following poem is um, about this. Um, the epigraph is taken from one of her letters. Poetry has been my spiritual guide throughout my incarceration. In the darkest of times, I turned to Neruda, and Hikmet, and Rukhaiser, and Ritzos, and Christos, and Whitman. 
The title of the poem is Neutralize. They mean to kill the sentient being in me. Neutralize. White. White. No poetry in white floors, walls, ceilings. White. White chairs, tables, sinks. White. Only when I close my eyes do I see beyond the white windowless walls remembering robin songs and lacy trees lightly green against baby blue. Silence, more silence to dry, drown out the incessant silences I fill my inner ear with robin songs, melodious and soothing. But how to quell the deadly non-human screeches and scrapes, sounding sounds bouncing off the walls. Dull smells of dead air in the cell but through the olfactory nerves of my mind, I can tickle with the zest of lemon, sweetness of wildflowers. Willfully bland diet aimed to erase use of my tongue, add a pinch of salt with a taste of sweat or even of my blood anywhere on my body remembering a taste of cheese. One human t touch allowed. My own arms enfold me. My fingers move over my sagging breasts. My nipples and soft bodies of my body respond. They mean to neutralize me, but poetry keeps me alive. Thank you. Now I'm going to read a couple of poems from Camp Notes. Um, and um, sadly, it's been 50 years, more than 50 years since I've written these poems, but these uh, appear to be somewhat, cur you know, current. And and this this poem was the last one that appeared in Camp in the series of Camp Notes. Um, after I left camp, we, I went to Cincinnati, and so the title of the poem is Cincinnati. Freedom at last in this town, aimless, I walk against the rush hour traffic, my first day in a real city where no one knew me, no one except one hissing voice that said, Dirty Jap warm spittle on my right cheek. I turned and faced the shop window, and my spittled face spilled on to a hill of books, words on display. In government square, people crisscrossed the streets like the spokes of a giant wheel. I lifted my right hand, but it would not obey me. My other hand fumbled for a hanky. My tears would not wash it. They stopped and parted. My hanky brushed the forked tears and spittled together. I edged toward the curb, loosened my fist hold, and the bleach laced mother iron hanky blossomed in the gutter atop Keith teeth marked gum wads and healed candy wrappers. Everyone knew me. The next poem is called To the Lady, and it's a kind of a call for action after Cincinnati. You know. To the lady, the one in San Francisco who asked, why did the Japanese Americans 
let the government put them in those camps without protest. Come to think of it, I should have run off to Algeria. I should have run off to Canada. <laughs> should have hijacked a plane to Algeria. Should have pulled myself up from my bra straps and kicked him in the groin. <laughs> should have bombed a bank. Should have tried self-immolation. Should have holed myself in a wood frame house and let you watch me burn up on the six o'clock news. Should have run howling down the street naked and assaulted you at breakfast by AP wire photo. Should have screamed bloody murder like Kitty Genovese. Then you would have come to my aid in shining armor. Laid yourself the, across the railroad track, right? Marched on Washington, tattooed a star of David on your arm, written six million enraged letters to Congress. But we didn't draw the line anywhere. Law and order, executive order 9066, social order, moral order, internal order, you let him. I let him, all are punished. Thank you. That last line is from uh, Romeo and Juliet, um, Shakespeare's, at the end of the, uh, that play, the prince shows up on the stage that is strewn with all these dead bodies, including Romeo and Juliet. And he proclaims very dramatically, look what your hatred has done. All your kinsmen are dead, and all are punished. <laughs> OK. OK, now I'm going to read the last uh, three short poems that are fairly uh, current, a new poem. And you might recognize some of the lines. Uh, this is, the title of this poem is Nevertheless. It all started in eighth century BC, Ithaca, when Penelope is told to go back to her quarters because speech is a business of men. And continues on to 21st century AD, United States Senate, when Elizabeth is told to be silent. She was warned, but nevertheless, she persisted <laughs> because the air has no gender. Do you remember that? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Next poem is called Ruler. My ruler is broken, has crooked lines, rough edges, splintered dimensions, cracked values, questionable standards, angers friends, befriends enemies, shows signs of dubious nature, never measures up. <laughs> That's a short and cryptic, right? <laughs> uh, we humans, all of you, each one of you, we all have this remarkable gift of imagination that you know, enables us to invent things, discover new lands, and it makes us hopefully 
compassionate towards people who are hoping for a life of freedom in a country that they've never seen. And so the title of my next poem is Pareidolia. Pareidolia is um, the, the images that we see on places like the full moon or uh, formations in the sky. And so, Pareidolia. See the dark shadows on the full moon? Try squinting and look hard, father said. You will see a rabbit pounding mochi with a mallet with a wooden, into a wooden usu. Yes, yes, I see. A white rabbit with a pink nose. One hundred years ago, Father heard the rhythm of mochitsuki from across the ocean and followed the full moon, promising great things to come. Hope in abundance with celerity. My father, born in the year of the rabbit, would welcome the masses pushing our borders today, carrying bags filled with dreams, seeking shadows on the full moon. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a wonderful, it's been a wonderful day. And um, I just loved hearing the young poets. And my whole family is here. It's just wonderful to see all of you my extended family, and these beautiful f friends of mine, some that I haven't seen for such a long time, but uh, please hang around and we could visit together. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. I felt so lucky to be able to read these poems before they came out, but I feel unbelievably blessed to be in this room and to get to hear you with this first reading. And I think everybody probably feels that same way. Just incredible. Thank you. Mitsue, for all the ways that you nourish us, encourage us, challenge us, and lead us, I give such thanks. Thank you for bringing your work to this space and for allowing us to witness and celebrate you. It's truly an honor. Thank you. <laughs> we have one more performer today who is a dear, dear friend of mine. Um, and we've had the exquisite opportunity to collaborate a lot over the last year, which has been really exciting. So for a little change of pace, we have some music coming your way. And then I'm going to come up here and be as quick as I can with thank yous, but they've got to get in. We're a little over time. So um, our last performer today is Kyoko Takanaka, who uses the pronouns they and them. Uh, they are a performance artist, singer, songwriter, often using the moniker Jin. Ginger Brew, a filmmaker and actor based in Los Angeles. Recently, their interest lies in combining all of these mediums. Their name, Kyoko, means vibrations of sound child in Japanese. Heavily influenced by artist activists such as Fred Ho and Nina Simone, Kyoko believes in artistic expression as a conduit for personal and collective liberation. Their work has been recognized by the Bruce Lee Foundation, Japan Film Festival, LA Shorts International Film Festival. They've performed at Janum, Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival, Tuesday Night Cafe, and Highways Performance Space. Let's give it up for Kyoko. <laughs> Hi there. Um, first, I just wanted to give it up for other Kyoko Nakamaru. If you could stand. Um, 
Yeah, I've just seen Kyoko put so much of their heart and soul in putting this event together and truly just bringing such an eclectic group of important activists and performers together. And I'm so honored to be here. And you did this all eight months pregnant somehow. So <laughs> seriously, bravo. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, of course, it's really hard to be here following up Mitsuya currently. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just wanted to also say so much gratitude to Mitsie for all the work that you've done for not just for the intergenerational Japanese Americans here, but I think uh, speaking as a first generation Japanese American person, um, seeing your work, like Kyoko said, I think for so many first generation folks feels like it's, it's so new and it's the first time that you're able to read something. And even when you're reading the poems that you did, just five minutes ago, you you have this transcendent feeling of past, present, and future that we're all speaking the same feelings and emotions and that all these first generation immigrants coming to the States, when I think when they read your work can really feel that they're not alone and that there have been people who have found the strength to write with such dignity and strength and that they can do that too. So thank you so much for your words. Thank you to everyone who's performed. Um, this song is called If We All Wait, and I wrote it about six years ago when I was living in New York at the time and reading so many of Diane Fujino's books actually that she edited about Fred Ho, Yuri Kochiyama, and learning about Asian American history and thinking about yeah how we can connect the past, present, and future. Oh, dear children, tell me what have you done to reap what I have sown? Yeah, we're watching from Say, we'll be. 
so over time so I'm gonna run through this and I know I already talk fast so apologies for those who can't understand me as an auctioneer <laughs> well it is a tall order to do justice to honoring one of the foremothers of the Asian American feminist movement I feel absolutely confident that we have done just that today were it not for the ways in which Mitsue's voice and efforts have shaped the world we walk in we JA feminists wouldn't have so many of the opportunities that we do I feel such deep gratitude for every single person that took the stage today, who put their heart and soul into the work that they gave us. Thank you for your walk and ways in this world, and thank you for saying yes to being a part of this program. Almost exactly six months ago, I sent a message to Hedy Mouchard, the talented designer behind, behind the book and one of Mitsue's daughters. We needed to let Janum know if we were going to have the book release party here. They had to make a decision. As it turned out, that was the day that Mitsu, um, already ill with pneumonia, had broken her back. Hedy and Mitsu were forced to make that call while treading incredibly uncertain waters, facing down the first steps in what would be a massive and complete recovery. Thankfully, that happened, and thankfully, they said yes. <laughs> Let's give a big round of applause to Hedy, who worked tirelessly. <laughs> <laughs> who worked tirelessly to compile her mother's poems, who continued to accommodate the asks of, just please add this last one to an almost finished, already numbered book, who worked with Nikkei and Japanese artists to create the aesthetics of Full Circle, and who brought this brilliant book of poems forward so that we could all read ourselves and our family's histories on these pages. Thank you. We'd like to thank Sharon Yamato, who has been behind the scenes making calls, connecting folks, and plotting how to best manifest this wonderful program. We couldn't have done this without all of your work, Sharon. Thank you. The Yamato family would like to extend their deepest thanks to Diane Fujino and USBC's Department of Asian Studies, who went out on a limb and made full circle their very first publication. They'd also like to thank Sonomi Kobayashi, the New York-based artist whose painting became the cover of Full Circle, as well as all of the other artists who are included in the book. A big thank you as well to Marilyn Chin, Andrew Tonkovich, and Lisa Alvarez for their contributions to the book. 
Thank you to the Japanese American National Museum for so graciously hosting this event, for supporting Mitsue Yamada's work, and for your patience with us as we very slowly plotted forward with the planning over the course of the last 10 months. Thanks especially to the team here who worked with us to bring this event to life. Koji Sakai, Joy Yamaguchi, Electra Matsushita, Maria Kwong, Rick Noguchi, and Cortland Shimada. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to extend gratitude to Little Tokyo and all of those who fight for it. When a community is able to be rooted in a place where its ancestors lived and died, where its history is most vibrant, it is able to continue to nourish the eldest and the newest generations. May we each renew or make a commitment to fighting for this critical space and pushing back against the displacement that gentrification causes that threatens and erases our home and our traditions. Our truest, deepest thanks to each and every one of you who showed up, who supported, who bought a book or is about to, who helped spread the word about today, and who have supported Asian American arts over the years. Mitsue would like for you to sign the guest book, and she'd really love for you to leave updated contact information. Hint, hint. We'll have that available to signing for you. We hope that you'll stick around, mingle, buy a book if you haven't already, and get this living legend here to put her signature on it, or you can get a picture with her, one or the other. Thank you so much for coming out today. And artists, if you would just join us up at the front here for a photograph for the Ralph Shimpo, that would be awesome. Thank you, you guys. Thank you.